So we're embarking now on our unpanel. Um, and the unpanel is um, our effort to do the panel a little bit differently. Um, it's uh, a lot of the things that we do are trying to take normal conference things and actually add more connection, more interaction, and more of a meaningful experience. Um, and so the title of this unpanel is COVID-19 Crisis and Consciousness, and Fields will introduce that in a moment. But I'm going to tell you the way the unpanel works. So um, the unpanel um, is a reverse panel where the panelists actually ask the audience questions. And I've worked with all of the unpanelists beforehand to come up with a question that gets to the very heart of this topic. And so what we're going to do is we're going to hear from each unpanelist for three minutes. And for three minutes, they're going to pitch their question to you. It's the most burning question that they have. And then we're going to split up into groups of three. And in those groups of three, you are going to uh, come up and uh, hold on. <laughs> this slide should be edited. It's not in the back of the book. Um, uh, so um, you are going to, in groups of three, you're going to come up with a response to, um, to that question. Um, and then you're going to uh, share, uh, you're going to post that in meet.ps. Um, and then just like in a Q&A, we're going to come back to the main room and we're going to hear from your responses and then discuss with the panelists. And I'm going to, you don't have to memorize that. Um, this is just to give you a sense of how it works. And then um, once we're ready at the time, I'm going to give you a reminder of what's, what our next steps are and how this is going to work again. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome um, Fields here, um, Joshua Fields onto the stage, um, and he's going to actually introduce the panelists, uh, introduce the topic and then the panelists. Yeah. Thank you, Mikey. And just so everyone knows, the on panel is Mikey's baby, and he holds it very tightly. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very honored to be hosting I think maybe the first person to host an unpanel that's not Mikey. So. And maybe my, maybe my least eloquent explanation of what an unpanel is. Sorry, I'm a little, a little scattered right now. <clears throat> yeah, well, thanks, Mikey, and also Nicole. That was an incredible talk. Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to give a bit of an overview in terms of like, why this panel is important and then give a, an introduction to the speakers. And so I think if you're at this conference, you, there's a hell of a chance that you share in the sensibility that an evolution in human consciousness is a necessary prerequisite for solving some of the biggest problems of our times. And what COVID has done, well, I, I really, I've seen COVID as like a pattern interrupter, like much in the same way that psychedelics are. And I believe we, we all sense the, both the profound and profound opportunities and grave dangers in this kind of liminal and turbulent sea that we're trying to swim in. And so there's a fine line between wisdom and barbarism and which way we go as a society, do we descend into the devils of our nature? Do we ascend to the angels of our being? I think the way we go as a society in response to COVID, to climate change, to exponential tech, it's going to be determined by the quality of the consciousness that we're holding as individuals and as a collective. And so what this panel will be looking at is really at our COVID situation as it pertains to human consciousness. What comes next, team next, and how we might ensure that this, this ecology of consciousness technologies, psychedelics, technology, and meditation, that we're exploring this weekend is, is stewarded in such a way that they will be able to provide maximum impact as a response to these crises upon us. And so it's an honor to be sitting on a panel with these esteemed guests. Um, so I'm just gonna introduce them all quite briefly. If I say your name, whoever's here, can you just unmute yourself and give a, a wee hello so that people know who's, who's about to come? So. Nicole. Hi. Hey, Nicole. So Nicole doesn't need another introduction, but just in case you missed her talk, she's the CEO and founder of the Willow Group, executive director of the TransTech Lab Conference and TT200 list, 
And as you heard from our talk, she's really the flag bearer of what comes next, or one of the flag bearers of what comes next. Uh, Dr. Roger Walsh. Hey, Josh. Hi, Joshua. Good to see you. Uh, so Roger is a professor of psychiatry, philosophy, and anthropology, as well as professor in the Religious Studies program at the University of California, Irvine. His books include Pass Beyond Ego, Essential Spirituality, The World of Shamanism, and The World's Great Wisdom. And Roger has been on deep retreat for the last couple of months and is uh, beginning to surface again in uh, the, uh, the outer world. So we're, we're very lucky to have him with us on this panel. Tim, a wee hello from Tim. Hey, guys. Uh, Can you hear me? So you, get, so you guys have obviously heard Tim, but again, just a quick one, like Nicole, partner, managing partner of the Mayfield Fund, co-founder of uh, North Star, and a close advisor to consciousness hacking and someone who has been very much on the front line of the coronavirus efforts in California. Dr. Roz Watts. Hello. Hi, Roz. So Dr. Rosalind Watts, she's the clinical lead of the Imperial College Psilocybin for Depression Study. She trained as a clinical psychologist and practiced psychotherapy for six years before joining the Imperial College Psychedelic Research Center. She's developed a psychedelic therapy model. And uh, yeah, we've only started to be in contact over the last few weeks, but I have a feeling that us Brits, consciousness interested Brits, will be bashing our heads to get to, uh, together sometime soon. And uh, Lindsay, Lindsay Briner. She can't unmute. Can someone check that in the tech? Hi everyone. Hey Lindsay. So, this is, so Lindsay is an executive coach, organizational consultant, and a research scientist in the fields of behavioral science, cognitive neuroscience, transpersonal psychology, and technology. And she's consulted for companies including the Chopra Foundation, Neurohacker, University of Arizona, and the TransTech Lab. So without further ado, what is going to happen is each speaker will give a three-minute overview of their question and the context surrounding their question. They're going to ask you guys that question. You're going to disperse into breakout groups and then we come back as a larger group and discuss what's been, what's been said in the breakouts. So Nicole, we'll start with you. You've got three minutes. Uh, no pressure. Oh, I just asked you if someone else could go first because I just talked. Oh, okay. Absolutely. Does anyone, well, Roger's next in the list. Roger, you feel ready to go first? Uh, sure. Um, oh. And this is in many ways a follow on from what Nicole was saying about the fact that this is a time which calls for contributions from all of us, new kinds of contributions. And clearly that's something which probably everyone at this conference is, is very much aware of. So the question I'd like to put out to everyone is, how do we contribute most effectively in times of crisis. And it's important to have a little bit of background for reflection on the, this question because uh, usually when there's a social challenge of some time, the, f the type, the first p response that people tend to have is, well, they, the government, the uh, people in power, those people should do something. But then after a little reflection, it becomes really apparent that the only way we can have an effect is for us to do something. And then the question becomes, what's, what can I do? And, but there's an even deeper question. What's the most strategic thing I can do? And it's really important to know that, that this is a particular kind of question. There are two kinds of questions. There are knowledge questions and wisdom questions. Knowledge questions have a one-time answer. Is it raining? Look outside the window, no rain, end of question. But wisdom questions like Collins, every time we ask them, they have the potential for taking us deeper into the question, deeper into ourselves, and deeper into reality. And the question, what's the most strategic thing I can do, is a wisdom question. So this is definitely worth our while exploring now, and it will be a question that hopefully is with us for the rest of our lives. 
it's also valuable to know a little bit, bit about how people tend to respond under threat. Under threat, it's very clear, the data is crystal clear, that people, the automatic tendency is for people to regress, to move to less mature, more defensive, uh, more tunnel vision and egocentric perspectives and ways of behaving. However, it's also clear from the research that if we provide the right in for help and a support, people can progress and grow and learn in the ways Nicole was talking about. And to do that, people need three things. They need a context, they need a purpose, and they need means. And the context is a meaning, a system. Uh, uh, so a skillful context might be, yes, this is a dangerous situation for which we didn't prepare well, but we have the opportunity to support, to respond now in ways which will make us a wiser, more cohesive and more mature community. And a skillful purpose might be, well, all of us are needed right now. And, and it's time for all of us to look for our contribution and then providing skillful means. Here are some ways in which people could help. So those three things, a context and, and meaning, a, a, a purpose and means are what really uh, make the difference here and enable people to grow into a skillful response to a crisis. Thank you, Roger. So just could you just repeat the question uh, that you want to pose to the audience and this will be put on our screen at the back uh, on, on, on your screen at the end of these questions. Sure. How do we contribute most effectively in times of crisis? Thank you very much. <clears throat> and just a note for other speakers, if you could start with your question and also end with it, that would be a good way to structure. Uh, how about you, Tim? Ready to go? Sure thing. Um, my question builds on Nicole's Team Next and Team Now framework. Um, essentially, it's this. It's about trade-offs. Is it worth sacrificing some of the aspects that may take more time or energy to get right up front, namely, you know, the sacred or, or the profound or the spiritual in something um, for the sake of getting solutions to people who need it most, aka now? Uh, for example, could we have a healthcare application of psychedelics without the sacred components? Should we? Even with meditation, we've seen mic mindfulness with uh, you know generic apps and and having uh, mindfulness go the way of yoga. Um, is that the way it should go? We sac we get wider access, accessibility, but is that sacrifice worth it to help the people um, who need it most quick and in times of urgent need like now? Um, I guess the last framing analogy I give: we always have these tensions and orthogonal axes to consider in the world of IT security. It's about convenience and accessibility in one frame, security on the other. You can have Fort Knox, but no one can get into it. You can have something be very porous and easy to get to, but it's not secure. So that's another similar analogy in sort of the framing of this question is this notion of accessibility, ease, um, you know, kind of the urgency of, of serving as many people as possible versus the slow, still, intentional time it takes to get these offerings right and to use them properly. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Could, could you just uh, finish off with your question again? Yeah, it's about, um, is it worth sacrificing the sacred or the spiritual for these solutions at a time when most people need it urgently? Thank you. We'll move to, to you, Rose. Um, so my question is, what values do you want to see shaping psychedelic entrepreneurship in the post-COVID world? So in this situation right now, lots of people are facing death, grief, depression, anxiety, loneliness, abuse, <clears throat> addictions, numbing of all kinds. And many of us who are familiar with the potential of psychedelic medicines feels that, that psychedelics could help with many, if not all, of these problems and so must be available to people who need them quickly. In my research, I've looked at the mechanisms of psychedelic therapy, and the main one seems to be connectedness to self, others, and the world. And a very common insight in psychedelic experience is we are all interconnected. And that's the same insight that seems to come from the mystical traditions and from contemplative practices. 
And during this time of mass isolation, we need tools for connection now more than ever before. But this time of crisis is also a time of incubation. For many of us that are doing okay, we have lots of time for developing ideas, dreaming the post-COVID world into being. And of all the tools we have for transformation, psychedelics are perhaps the most powerful. Meditation takes a lot of time and practice, patience. The media disseminate the idea that a single dose of psilocybin can change your life forever. And interest in psychedelics is exploding. So I too see two areas of psychedelic on entrepreneurship which are booming right now. On the, on the one end, we have the medical drug development business. And on the other hand, we have the uh, psychedelic wellness startups. So do you see any threats or risks from the way these two ends are forming? So at one end, the risk of big pharma, competition, maximizing profit, cutting corners perhaps, making the therapy cheaper because then it's more profitable. And on the other hand, with, with the psychedelic startups, we have some examples of psychedelic superficiality. So people perhaps positioning themselves as psychedelic healers without the necessary training, that kind of thing. I saw one psychedelic conference where you can enlist the services of a psychedelic stylist. So uh, we know that psychedelics are non-specific amplifiers and depending on the set and setting, they can be used to lessen the ego or strengthen the ego. So I don't really have any evidence to back up that my idea, but I have a feeling that whereas dedication to contemplative practice is likely to lead to self-awareness and kindness, I think that dedication to psychedelics is more likely to promote narcissism. So people used to say that meditation was climbing the mountain, whereas psychedelic experience was getting the elevator to the top. But what if psychedelics and meditation take us up two different mountains? So the question is really, where do we want psychedelics to take us? What are the values that are foremost in the psychedelic organizations that are incubating big plans right now? And is this the way you want the psychedelic field to develop? So during this time of reflection for our, about ourselves, each other, and the world around us, we have a moment of opportunity to consider what do we want psychedelic therapy to look like and feel like, and to determine what we want it to do for the world. So implementing these values is another matter, how we actually create these structures. But first we need to clarify what those values are. So the question again, what values do you want to see shaping psychedelic entrepreneurship in the post COVID world? Thank you, Roz. Moving on to Lindsay. Okay, hi everyone. My question is how can we as a community be more mindful of the sense of immediacy when developing and promoting technologies that impact cognition. So based on my research, I believe we are at like the tip of the tipping point of a cascade of actually more crises to come. Um, and as we can see with coronavirus, global crises gives the impression of needing immediate solutions and immediate results. Plus, our current market dynamics are also structured in the immediacy of quarterly uh, return of investment. So um, with this system of complex urgencies, how can companies like trans tech companies take into consideration the cognitive effect or potential, potential, potentially like permanent changes in brain development on whole communities over a long term trajectory? So impact on communities such as potentially resulting in um, species differentiation between economic classes and also whole generations or both, um, and both in unpredictable ways. So the question is one of ethics that I'm coming from um, with the Native American frame where I'm questioning the consideration of seven generations forward. Um, this question also rests um, in the observation that the current status of both the emerging industries of the legalization of psychedelics, as well as transformative technology, mostly focus on the individual, like um, with one-on-one -on -one clinical sessions, as well as devices that we mostly use at home. Um, so when thriving is primarily engineered on an individual level, the risk is in increasing the inequalities that lend to some core issues of certain types of global crises in the first place. So where is the role of community in consideration to building the further future? Um, so I'm asking this question so that we as a micro community can be upstream to the further future to ensure it's truly one of awakening um, by addressing the potential traps of immediacy. 
Um, there's a saying that I learned from Bayo Akomalafai of the Western Indigenous um, tribes that says, when times are urgent, let us slow down. When times are urgent, let us slow down. So again, my question is, how can we as a community be mindful of the potential trap of immediacy when developing and promoting technologies that impact cognition, especially in these times of urgency and crisis? Thank you, Lindsay. And I really see the, see the parallels between that and, and Tim's question. Um, Nicole. Awesome. Thank you so much. So, um, so my question is, how do we create and innovate well-being technology and um, actually deploy those things to the people who need it in a humanistic way? Um, and so one of the things that, that I would say, it's actually, I'm, I'm glad that I got to go at the end. Um, uh, a couple of things. I actually gave a talk. My talk, my keynote at TransTech last year was um, called The Faster Train. Um, which is, I guess, a contrast to a lot of the slowness. And, and it was called the faster train because of the pace and the speed of our crisis. So the technology crisis, the, um, you know, the environmental crisis, now the COVID crisis. Um, and I realize, you know, one of the things that is sort of, you know, implicit in that, that I want to make explicit is that I actually have a great deal of faith in human beings. I really do. I have a deep, deep, faith. And, and what that faith is based on is it's been my observation, and this is personal, that people deeply want to belong. They deeply want to be connected. Um, they deeply want to be seen. They deeply want to love and be loved. Um, and they deeply want kin. Like we deeply want to be kin. And so I believe that the reason why we're not able to do that uh, is one, the noise of modern life, and two, that we never actually had the skills for it really. Um, you know, and there's a lot of human history that shows that we actually were really bad at that, um, which showed up in you know, um, the way that, you know, just the progress of rights over time. Um, so I think, I, I think implicit in a lot of what I uh, put forward is that I actually believe that when we get the space in our minds, uh, we will reach for one another. Uh, we did a big, a big chunk of the work that we did uh, last week at our summit um, probably a third of the companies were social wellness companies that were all about interpersonal um, health uh, and connection and wellness. And so, you know, and that actually, but, but the, the perception that it's all very individual is a really fair one um, because, and this goes back to my original question, um, it's like, how do we, especially at a time like now, um, create and innovate these well-being technology products that actually, um, you know, that actually would be more aligned for, or, or more, have more of the companies that are working on social and emotional wellness, interconnectional, interconnected wellness, uh, kin space, and creating that uh, with people. And so, and that just, you know, you know, across the, if you guys remember the spectrum that I laid out, it's like we need things all across the spectrum um, and they need to have great design and be human centered. And a big premise of ours with transformative tech is that humans, you know, must stay in the loop. Like the very best products have a human in the loop somewhere. Um, and so, you know, with that, it's like the real question for me, my burning question is, you know, how do we, how do we create a process or how do we create a shared space so that um, the creation and the development of these products happen? Because it's like, we have to iterate, we have to try, we have to experiment and um, that it's done in a humanistic way, that it keeps humans in the loop, and that it actually gets to the people who need it. Because what we have right now, which is really extraordinary, uh, whether it's for transformative technology, where we work with creators and capital, um, so innovators and entrepreneurs and the people who believe in that, in funding that, um, or to the other Nexters, you know, the Nexters who are across, you know, all the different realms of Next. Um, you know, right now there is a gap. Um, you know, and memory with, there's a gap, people are experiencing this. And we actually have a moment uh, of where the possibility of great change, great change, where this is an issue that's very, very present to everyone. Um, 
And so we have, a, we have an opportunity of great change. And so I feel what's keeping me up at, at night is not wasting resources, uh, not being, you know, not being redundant. Um, you know, I want to know all the nexters that are proximate to what I'm working on so that we can work together. Um, because if we all, you know, push our shoulders to that side of the boat, that's for an awakened future, then I actually think we can really get something done, um, you know, in this time uh, that we have before the next crisis. So my question is, how do we create and innovate, um, I guess, let's call it team next technology and deploy those, deploy it to those who need it? Thank you, Nicole. And thanks to all our, all our panelists. So what's going to happen now is Mikey is going to share uh, those questions. And then you guys are going to be split up into, into groups. <clears throat> you will have 15 minutes to discuss one of these questions and you can discuss whether you agree, disagree, your response. You could even come back with another question. And what's going to happen at the end of the 15 minutes, we're going to ask, one person from each group to write in meet ps their response to a specific question so you only get to choose you need to choose between your group the one question that you want to focus on you guys are going to communicate over that for 15 minutes you come back one person from that group will write in meet ps and then i'll moderate a discussion between those questions and the panelists themselves So I'm just going to, I'm going to just reiterate that really quick. So if everyone goes now, you'll see there's an unpanel section in Meet PS at the bottom. Uh, if you see on the screen, all you do is you click that unpanel section. You're going to see all the questions there, all five questions. Um, your response, for example, if you want to, if you, as a group, you choose Nicole's question, you're going to decide on one. It's kind of part of the process. It's a consensus process. You choose one. And if you're going to respond to Nicole's, you click on that. And then you can add a new comment here as a response. And we're going to have um, about 15 minutes to do that as a group. Okay. So the way this works is in materials, you are going to click this breakouts link. And when you're done, you click the main conference link to come back. So to leave, you click the breakouts link. And when the breakout is over, which you'll know your breakout room will be closed. When the breakout is over, you click the main conference link to come back. All right. Good luck, everybody. We hope to see you back here in a little bit. Let's get clicking. Uh, what, what do we do, Mikey? Um, so for the unpanelists, um, you, we're just going to hang out. Um, yeah, we don't. Yeah, you've got, to, you've got a break. Okay, should we and, leave and come back? Because it, we're not... You're not doing anything. And so right now, essentially, if you're choosing not to join the unpanel, um, which is totally fine, it, it, you know, if you want to have a little break, um, then you're welcome to just, uh, to just hang out, to have a little break, to stretch, to, to get some okay. tea. Um, it's going to be about, ten, uh, it's gonna be about 10 12, minutes. 12 minutes or so. Okay. Um, while people are discussing their questions. And again, um, if you are open to it. Um, it's, it's, it's a nice process to connect with some people a little more deeply, to have a chance to have a little small group interaction. Um, and so we encourage you to just click that link in the material section um, that says breakouts link, and that will take you into a small group discussion. And then you just choose which question you want to focus on. And then oh, can we hang way. out here? Can we yeah. hang out here instead? And uh... yeah, for the unpanelists, for for Roger and Nicole, all of you, you could just you're just hanging. You're just on a break. Good. Relax. Well, I'd be interested in in talking to some of them, oh. the unpanelists. Yeah. Well, that's what I was <laughs> going to say. We we didn't want to we didn't want to say that otherwise we'd have too many people staying for the juicy stuff. But um, yeah, I think it would make sense for uh, myself, yourself, Roger, um, and Rose and. And Lindsay, I think Tim and Nicole have both left the room, but um, yeah, just to really talk about this crisis um, and where you're at personally with regards to um, like your, your own sensibility as to 
where this is going. Are you hopeful? Are you pessimistic? Are those two terrible words, terrible duality you don't want to choose from? How about agnostic? So what does that mean in this context, Roger? Well, which context? This crisis or the, all, the, all the crises heading our way, as, as several people have already pointed out. Yeah. Um, the meta crisis. I, I, was sensitive to, I was sensitive that I might be, have run, used my three minutes, but had I, had I said everything I wanted to, I would have said that um, my hope is that we can use this crisis as leverage to bring a greater awareness to the, and less denial to the other crises that we know are barreling towards us. We've known we we're up for a pandemic. I mean, I'm a psychiatrist. I wrote something a decade ago talking about, you know, the inevitability of a pa pandemic. And, you know, lots wiser and smarter and more professional people than I wrote about this, but did we pay any attention? My university hospitals begging begging people in the, in the streets for, for masks and supplies. I mean, it's just insane. So can we leverage this for more effective responses to the other crises we, we know are coming at us? Yeah. And Rose, do you, is your sense that things in Europe and the UK are, are different in terms of how we're stepping up to this vis-a-vis -vis the US? You know, I have, I don't even really know. I mean, I've taken a kind of um, radical uh, kind of shutdown approach in a way to the outside world and just really, really kind of hibernated and gone in. So we have a little psychedelic community of our own that's in lockdown together. And we're all like kind of coming up with our own ideas and trying to be team next together. And in a way, part of that has been engaging less with the news and with what's going on outside. So in a way I'm kind of, I don't really know. Yeah. I'm a little bit jealous of your lockdown. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and, and Lindsay, I don't, we didn't mention this, but I mean, your focus on this intersection of existential risk and transformative technology is I think fast. The last time we met, I mean, this is what we spoke about and, a lot of these risks are actually coming to fruition. Like, are you seeing that the research you're doing actually play itself out in the world? Um, not yet. I think my research I'm hoping is gonna be upstream to as things continue mm -hmm. um, to unfold, uh, which is exciting. I started working on that topic almost two years ago, about a year and a half ago or so. so I'm glad that I got a little bit ahead before this all started. Yeah. Lin Lindsay, you went on the original roster of people we got, so I wasn't able to, I, I and I expect others weren't able to look you up. Can you just say where you're based and, and what the research you're doing is? Sure, yeah. I'm based in California, Northern California in Marin, in Mill oh. Valley. Oh, well, that's where I am, right? Oh. <laughs> we we'll are probably wave at you out the window. <laughs> Oh, good question. All right. Well, we, we have to we have to make sure we connect to connect then. Sure. Yeah, I would love to connect. Um, I have been I actually as an intern for over three years at Nicole's lab with Jeffrey Martin at the Transformative Technology Lab, uh -huh. and I was studying transpersonal psychology and the neuroscience and psychology of higher states of consciousness. And I've moved on now and I'm investigating, I'm doing a qualitative data collection and, and in interviewing executives of trans tech companies on their emotional valiance towards uh, global crisis. Yeah, and particularly trans tech companies that are more on the transpersonal and spiritual side of things. Great, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, the when, when I, when I, so I, I did my, I've been researching and, and Roger knows this collapse, civilization collapse dynamics for the last like two and a half years. And so it's been a little bit surreal seeing over the last few months, things start to really like the systemic fragilities that I also studied in my dissertation, like really starting to, to bear some bad fruit. Um, and What's kind of hit me was that I was able to like define the problem pretty well. But when it comes to like actually being in the mess, 
because I always had this like thesis, like, look, consciousness change is a necessary prerequisite in order to transcend the crises, but being in it, I, it just feels like there's this liminal space where, um, like do people, would people actually use technologies when they're freaking the hell out? Like, would you go and use your neurofeedback machine when you're scared that there's going to be food riots? And, and I just wonder, like, can these tools actually be used? Um, let me reframe this in a different way. And this kind of speaks to a little bit of your guys' question about immediacy, but like, can they be used in a, in a, in a crisis moment in order to uplevel people? Or are they much more like, like Tim was saying, like much slower burners to change the kind of like interiority of a culture? Yeah. And we have some data on what kinds of things produce rapid uh, changes and what don't. And we know that, for example, trying to, trying to move people up developmental stages is a long multi-year process. Learning to change attitudes runs across a lot of resistance, but the most rapid thing of all is reframing. That is giving people an alternate perspective or context mm -hmm. with which mm -hmm. to interpret things. And that can be done in moments if it's done skillfully. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> we have some, you know, I think it's a, it's a great question. And we have some data that can guide us in, in our responses to what are the most skillful interventions uh, in times of crisis or at any time. Yeah. And clearly we need both short and long-term responses. If we're lucky, you know, we won't have the civilizational collapse. You've been very uh, powerfully and skillfully pointing out to us at this stage. So we're still in this for the long game, but we're also, we're both, both in a short and long-term game. And I think, hope one of the things this community can do is bring bring its skills to this crisis, but also hold the larger, longer perspective that we so desperately need. Well, I'm just getting a message in the chat from Ariel, who runs uh, Mew, who co-founded Muse, the headband. And um, she said, we have more Muse users than ever now. And the response has been really huge with regards to Muse usage. We're seeing people dust off old Muses, more customer care calls than at Christmas time. So I think that is, that's super interesting. Ariel, I mean, feel free to, you might not want to speak today, but feel free to pop up and, and add your, your two cents. But I think that's fascinating. Yeah. And Joshua, you wrote a great article on, you know, the, the state of co-hack and, and pointing to some of the misuses of these things as well. Yeah, Roger, I'm going to answer that. Ariel, can someone please in the tech team, please unmute Ariel so she can speak. Uh, Ar Ariel Muse. And uh, yeah, no, absolutely, Roger. Yeah, that's, uh, it's been an interesting journey into the, the kind of idealism and the the, uh, the shadowy side to all these tools, it's like anything, right? Um, I think Roz was saying like non-specific amplifiers. I think technology is ultimately going to be the same, right? <clears throat> so Josh, just add some color to your thought. Are people turning to technologies now in the moment of yeah. crisis? And the answer really seems to be yes. Um, we've seen both an increase in sales and an increase in usage over people that have Muses. So people with existing practices are using it more. People who might've bought a Muse in 2014 are all of a sudden finding them again, unearthing them, calling us, trying to download you know, the latest because they haven't used it in years. And it's really mm -hmm. something that they're turning to. So it seems that technology is a meaningful solution for people in this time. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great to hear. Sorry, Lindsay. That's... No, thank you, Ariel. It's exciting to hear. I also, I wrote a blog that made the medium headlines on um, meditation resources, but I was more focusing on blogs, or um, not blogs, um, apps. And what I found when I was doing the research on the apps is that they're just, they're blowing up too. People are really looking for the extra support for meditation right now too, so. It's cool 
Yeah, thank you, Ariel, for popping up. It's good to see you. Um, <clears throat> and Roz, just bringing you on in here as a Brit, dropping some lines. You're, uh, you're muted. Yeah. I think we're, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if we're kind of behind in terms of using these kind of technologies, but I, I've never, I've never used any of them actually. And I don't, I don't think they're as, as popular here yet, maybe, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I guess hopefully it'll be coming. I've never tried one before. In fact, can someone tell me about it? What is, what is, what does the Muse headband do? <clears throat> How does it help? Well, <laughs> you have the first one. I'm now unmuted. So, <laughs> um, so Muse gives you real-time feedback on your brain activity during meditation. We're one of many existing trans tech solutions out there now. Um, so probably other people in this audience can speak to what they create. Um, what it does is it tracks your brain during meditation and lets you know when you're in focused attention versus mind wandering. Mm -hmm. And the metaphor we use is your mind is like the weather. So when you're thinking or distracted, you actually hear it as stormy. And as you come to quiet focused attention, it quiets the storm. So you've got mm -hmm. real time feedback on your brain as well as your heart, your breath, and your body. Oh, wow. Yeah, because we, we use um, meditation as aftercare for the participants in our, in our study, Psilocybin for Depression Research. So uh, yeah, I could be recommending some of those for them. And actually we use the same metaphor of like, um, yeah, the, the weather, like your mind, like the weather, it's part of our protocol, so interesting. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, we thought a lot about different metaphors for the mind to help people understand how to use this new technology. You know, back in the days when they were trying to figure out how we use computers and teach people to use it, they came up with the metaphor of a desktop and files that you can drop and drag. And that became a really intuitive way to use this new interface of a computer. And so when we tried to think about how you use the interface of your brain in a way that was going to be intuitive with technology, we recognized that weather was the thing that make, made the most sense. You could hear it as stormy, you could hear it as calm. Mm. And the idea that it's always changing, that every weather system changes. It's good to remember that right now, in fact, that you know we're in a process of transformation, but the storm ends at some point and blue skies emerge. And with it comes more flowers. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. <clears throat> well, Tim, welcome back into the space. We we're just uh, having a, an open discussion with the panelists. And I've, I've actually got a question for you before we get the official thing moving again is. And, and just so, so you know, it feels we, everyone's streaming back in now, just so you know, they're, they're arriving. Back perfect. In. Okay. Um, you can still go on. I just wanted you to know that. I'm just trying to figure out whether I have enough time because it's a good, it's a, it's a question I really want to ask. Why don't you save it as the first question? I'm going to save it. I'm going to save okay. it. <clears throat> so what, welcoming all the people who have teleported away and are now um, streaming back into the main, the main room. Um, but go ahead, Fields. Don't let me uh, barge in here. No, well, it was a pretty, pretty brief thing around um, in my two and a half years kind of being in the conscious attacking space. And um, there's a lot of technologies focused on, on state change. And uh, I'm in, again, I used Wilbur's model before, but like these four stages of, of four vectors of human consciousness, waking up, growing up, cleaning up and showing up. I'd say like 90% of people who think about conscious attacking, they think about the waking up piece. And I'm very curious with regards to the cleaning up piece and technology. Like can technology be built in such a way where we measure HRV, brain signals, physiological responses, bring people into a felt sense of repressed emotion in the same way that a psychedelic might do and actually titrate the level of emotion that's able to be um, kind of released from the contractions that trauma often brings. And I'm, I've been asking this question for a while, like how many people are actually working on the cleaning up technology piece? Um, and obviously a lot of that's implicit, like some neurofeedback can lead to like PTSD cures, but I'm speaking about the, the, the trauma that's kind of stuck in the contractions of the nervous system. How can technology support that release? And so I was going to ask Tim, Tim, do you know any, any companies who are kind of in that, that way of thinking? Um, I'm seeing a couple that, this is really rudimentary and not even sort of on the advanced hacking side of it, but um, there's more and more tools that are recording all of our 
speech patterns, how we behave in meetings. They're usually in the guise of analytics or for uh, performance coaching. But talk about harsh mirror. Uh, what's really interesting on the growing up, cleaning up, showing up part is just learning to see yourself as others do. And so as simple as it sounds, imagine there was coaching and analytics on how you phrase every sentence, how you say things to every person, how you come across to everybody. Um, it pretty soon will be an era where you're wearing always on cameras recording and um, there's a great science fiction story uh, by Ted Chiang. Uh, in it, there's like a, a, a parent who thinks he's a great dad and then the daughter plays back the video of this conversation they had and he literally sees himself talking to her from her eyes and he's like, oh my God, I am an asshole, you're right. And so uh, I'm wondering if something as simple as that and always on mirror from all of us, what's that saying? Everybody is a mirror for the best and worst parts of you. Well, pretty soon this ubiquitous chief technology for this always on will be there. And uh, when we can see that, I think that's a huge uh, self-accountability. Yeah, um, I, I can give you two examples that are in uh, one in market and one that was an experiment. Um, mm -hmm. I think a really great tool for cleaning up um, are tools that give therapists and the talented teachers who are out there in the world superpowers to support the people that they support. So one product that I just really love is Feel. Uh, we've showcased them at the conference last year um, it's a band that's HRV, GSR, and skin temp. Um, it's in a 10-week CBT program. Um, and the, the way that it works, and, and you know, before when they were just a band, they're so much more effective now that there's a human with the band. And so what they do is the, the therapist takes the person through the 10-week program, teaches them the elements of, of uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. They get, to, they get, the, they get the session, then they have the band on and they get to apply what they learned and actually see it in their numbers as they are going through the week. And then they get to the next week. So it's also a visual reminder of what they've signed up for and they get the numbers. Humans love feedback, but often a lot of the feedback that came off of wearables was non-contextual and it didn't have a human being in the process. And so this loop that includes human technology and the person who is seeking to clean up whatever it is they're seeking to clean up, um, their trials were fantastically more successful uh, than technology alone or therapist alone. Um, so I think that's a really great example. Another great example is a friend of mine who was a data scientist um, at, um, uh, she was working on Watson and there was someone who, um, you know, there was a really nice person, uh, but who didn't realize how much he talked and how much he talked over the women in meetings. And so um, they made a watch, she made a Watson app that um, could tell who was talking and whether or not they were on subject. And at the end of the first time they used it, um, he was able to see that he overspoke the women in the meeting um, most of the time. And that was the first time he actually was able to see it. So it was a tiny thing. She hacked it together in six weeks. Yeah. Probably a fundamental change in this person's life and leadership ability. That's fascinating. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> so we've got uh, all of our people back. So we're going to just dive into uh, question one. Uh, the most. Okay. And just so people can follow along those folks that yep. didn't go into the breakouts, you're going into meet.ps into the unpanel section. Um, and in there, you're going to find the five questions. And we're looking in the uh, comments for those five sections. Those are the results of everyone's discussion. And so you're welcome to check out their comments. You're welcome to upvote their comments um, uh, uh, if you can. I think you can, yeah. Um, and, uh, and back to you, Fields. Sure. Okay, so Rose's question, what values do you want to see shaping psychedelic entrepreneurship in the post-COVID world? The most top rated answer was radical transparency, redistribution of wealth and resources. So, Rose, you're, you're nodding your head. How does, how does that land in terms of the values that you want to see being integrated? Could you, sorry, Josh, could you say them again? Radical transparency, redistribution of wealth. And resources. Those two? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, we, we're, we're facing a, yeah, an interesting time right now because, um, 
there are there are various different models, um, and this uh, this re this idea of redistribution of wealth and resources really surprises me that that's come up. I'm so glad it has, um, and that resonates very much with a model that is being proposed by somebody called Bennett Zellner. He's an economist, and he's working for Usona. Usona are a, a psilocybin manufacturer, and they are a not-for-profit compared to some of the other ones which are for-profit. And the um, Bennett Zellner's work was based around the idea that um, that social inequality maps on very closely to mental health problems. And so the idea that we would have that we would create these situations where a few very wealthy shareholders are making millions from from psychedelic treatments, and that all the all the profits are going back to this tiny proportion, it's just perpetuating that huge social inequality. It's perpetuating the very the very thing that's causing mental health problems for so many people in the first place. So it has to change. So it is quite a radical departure from, from the current model, but his pollinator model, I think, offers such hope because it's, I won't go into too much detail now, but it's really worth looking up. Um, he has a really amazing um, PowerPoint presentation. I think if you Google him, you can find it. Um, and it's basically this idea that if psilocybin is, is um, is a non not for profit entity and is provided to community groups. It can act as a kind of pollinator, pollen um, to to provide a rejuvenating input to these communities. So the idea would be that there would be a pollinator clinic in different places, and it would use local people to work in the clinic, and it would use local resources. And the idea would be kind of by the people for the people, essentially. So this is this is a, such an empowering idea. It's I guess so many of us that. Um, that yeah wonder how uh, we're gonna marry the two ideas of the, the, the way that psychedelics have been used ceremonially and in tribal groups and indigenous groups with this idea of this uh, production of psilocybin or other uh, psychedelics in a, in a lab and then this mass distribution and, and huge profit and of course huge huge um, benefits to people too um, but yeah the the redistribution of wealth and resources I think is is something that we can't overlook because there is this thing that um, I think ties into uh, the question of Tim, this idea of we need it so much. So do we just push it through regardless? We need it so much. So many people need it. Do we just push it through and allow it to replicate the current models? Or do we say, yeah, we need it so much, but we need it to change. We need the whole distribution framework to change. Otherwise, we're just replicating the problems that produce mental health difficulties in the first place. So I'm very happy to see redistribution of wealth and resources up there. I mean, the other one, radical transparency. Yes, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's, there, there, are, there are huge issues with that. Um, but again, it's, it's the same thing about um, the, the current models we have and, and what we've put up with up till now and how we need to, how we need to change it. So hopefully, um, I'm, I'm very, very happy to see those two coming at the top because in a way, like I think what often happens is um, the main value is about personal transformation, personal transformation. Like I want to, you know, psychedelics are about my own personal transformation. And when they are the values, then that enables um, these substances to be um, disseminated through the usual channels because it's all about me, me improving myself. But when it is about, um, the community, the collective, that's when these, these values become more important. And that's when I see the most uh, possibility that psychedelics could be used to actually change the systems of distribution of uh, well-being and healthcare. So I'm happy. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to segue there, Ros, I think quite nicely to Roger, because the, the point that was brought up for Roger is how can we contribute most effectively in a time of crisis? Uh, one of the top rated one there was also redistributing capital. And so um, there's clearly a, a deep systemic dynamic here that um, people want to speak about. Um, but I, I suppose to, 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 to change tack a little bit, because Roz spoke slightly to that, the other one that was asked of you, Roger, was uh, when, in, in response to your question, how, how can we contribute most effectively? The answer was by identifying the intersection between our circle of competence, where we can add value to others, and the circle of influence, where and who we can influence. What do you make of that? Well, sounds right, sounds right on. One of the key, th key questions as we look at how we can contribute best is to look at what our unique capacities and 
uh, influences are, and part of that is, okay, what are my specific gifts, talents, uh, skills, etc. But the other is, what are the particular networks I'm part of? How can I, how can I influence those? How can I reach out to others? So yeah, I think it, it touches very nicely on two key elements of, of the question of what allows us to be most effective. And that's in your profession as a professor and also background in psychiatry and, and, and the mind, do you have a sense as to um, how people best understand what their circle of competence is, especially in a crisis? So for example, if we're sitting at home and we're feeling not part of team next and not even part of team now, we're trying to be like, how on earth do I actually serve in this moment? What is your sense in terms of how people can actually, um, use wisdom traditions and practices in order to get a better understanding of that if you call it a daemon or dharma or something something like that well there, there's a lot in what you said so a couple of couple of responses one is keep in mind as we we're talking about these are wisdom questions so it's not at all that we should expect we'll immediately come up with a response or a, or a clear answer as to what our sc most skillful contribution is these are questions which are really to be sat with over time uh, so that's the first first thing and then the question of can the uh, consciousness practices and technologies we have had available to us uh, and we'll have hopefully uh, complement, uh, catalyze our capacities. Ab absolutely so. And and there's another element too that's very important to recognize, and that is, it's not only what our contributions are, but how we make them. And we can do our contributions from any number of perspectives, from egocentric to world centric, from. Uh, and, but it's also really important to recognize that the, the optim, optimal contributions are done as a spiritual practice. And the tradition in which this is most, uh, most widely uh, discussed is, are the yogic traditions where karma yoga, which is the yoga of using our work and action in the world as our spiritual practice. And karma yoga has three key elements. First, we offer what we're doing to a larger source, usually to God, uh, but it can be any transpersonal uh, ideal or domain. Second, we do our work as skillfully as we possibly can. And the third element, which is the real kicker, is we cite while we're working as skillfully and hard as we possibly can for our ideal and to contribute, we simultaneously let go of our attachment to the outcome. So it's those three elements which transform mundane activity and contribution, which may be really fine work, into a spiritual practice. Uh, so we go into ourselves to go out more effectively into the world, and we go out into the world in order to go deeper into ourselves. And it's that cycle which allows us to optimize both our own maturity, well-being, cleaning up, growing up, etc., and the effectiveness of our contribution. Could you just repeat those three things just in bullet points, Roger, so we can put them in the chat? Yeah, the, the three key elements of karma yoga are first, offering one's activity to some transpersonal ideal, usually traditionally God. Second, doing one's work as skillfully and impeccably as one possibly can. And third, simultaneously relinquishing attachment to the outcome. Thank you very much. I'd love it if someone could actually write that in the chat. I started, but um, I gotta gotta move on. Thank you, Roger. <clears throat> uh, Tim, we're gonna gonna head to you now, and uh, your 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 question around can we maintain the sacredness or, or feeling this kind of tension between the sacred and the immediacy? Uh, the response to that was uh, these tools will probably always return to the sacred even if they're removed initially so perhaps better to keep it there in a way that could be universally received by all communities and cultures with science to back it up of course almost like the the tools have an intelligence of their own and they'll always move towards the light that's what i get from that one i agree with that um josh you know i've talked about this before too but 
I still in my heart believe there's a false dichotomy between the spiritual and the scientific. I keep thinking that they're, they seem like they're in different directions, like you're heading in 180 degrees. But if you go deep enough, far enough down the rabbit hole, they will circumnavigate this, this sphere and meet at the other end, right? Um, or as Mikey had said, what is it? There's but one truth and many roads to that mountaintop. So I, I do like to believe that as well. Yeah. <clears throat> so we'll, uh, and just other panelists, if you have any, they, these aren't specific questions to specific panelists. So if you have any impulse to jump in, please, please do. Uh, and moving on to, to, to Nicole. How do we design and deploy the increasingly needed tools for global well-being? Well, here we go. This is not too dissimilar. Entrepreneurship as a spiritual path, reframing uh, you know. entrepreneurship and organizational culture from the perspective of personal development. I love that one. I love that one. I, I agree with it completely. Um, I've, uh, Gino is an old friend. And so we've had that conversation of, um, you know, it's, it's also very much a karma yoga thing too. It's like, you know, having the, the act of building, um, the act of building these things become a, a spiritual path and a spiritual path is the act of building these things. Hmm. So yes, I agree. And do you, do you see that manifesting in the Valley? Because like we, we said a little bit earlier that you cannot separate innovator from innovation. Do you, sense that people who have their hands on the tools with the most exponentially powerful tools are actually understanding that feedback loop and are doing the work? Hmm. Well, I mean, um, so for our online inc um, accelerator, 20% uh, of our content is um, growth and development content. Um, and so, you know, uh, our description to people is that, you know, the we are deeply interested in your personal growth and development for two reasons. One um, is um, people's ability to actually lead a team because, you know, when you're, when you're leading something, you're essentially, you know, convincing, you know, strange people to go to a strange land and do strange things. And, you know, and the ability for people to do that and to go through everything that it takes to build something, um, you know, it's very, very difficult. And so the extent to which you have worked on your ego increases the likelihood that you and your team members will be able to do that together because it is not for the faint of heart you know it is not a it is not a journey without peril um and so you know the the more ego people have um the more difficulty um they seem to have with that and then on the other side is you know to have the maturity the you know the mental and emotional and spiritual maturity um to know what you're doing when you're doing it um, so knowing when you're coming up against an unintended consequence and having the ability to say, oh crap, that's, you know, like, should we do that? And I've, you know, been in conversations with several entrepreneurs and, uh, uh, leadership teams who have decided not to do something. Um, and they had the conversation, um, and it was because of, you know, where they were uh, in terms of like how they were relating to their ego and, and how they communicated with one another and those kinds of things. So yes, I have seen it. Um, I've also seen, you know, lots of people who maybe in their previous life did not, or their previous startup or company did not think in that way, but that in the time between have started to work on it and are now trying to figure out how they integrate the two. Um, so I think we're actually going to see a lot more of that um, too. Um, so the answer is, the answer is yes, I see it. So that I can I have, a, I have a question with regards to that, and I can link a bit to Tim, which is it has been suggested that awakening or, yeah, some pretty rapid or, or waking up and um, effective entrepreneurship, at least initially, um, don't merge too well together. That waking up experiences can often lead to lack of motivation and not lead to as effective entrepreneurship. So... I'd be curious to know if, if you guys think that's, that's accurate. Well, so first of all, it's like the, you know, the, the, it's a process, right? Like it's a, it's a, it's a process and, you know, and people get to different depths at different times. 
So, you know, so when you're saying awakening, you actually have to define exactly what awakening is. Is it the, it's, is it the beginning of the understanding that there is something more and there's a different way that you want to live? Or is it, you know, full, you know, uh, full Buddhahood? Like, which one is it? Um, and so, or, and, and there is a whole range in between. So, you know, the, the, you know, many people, the process of, you know, of chipping off bits of ego, like it doesn't really happen overnight. <laughs> Sometimes it can, and there's certainly some process out there that do that, uh, of which you guys, you know, know which ones I'm involved in for that. But, uh, you know, there's all different stages and there's a lot of people in the world. You know, there's, there's almost 8 billion people in the world, right? And so, um, you know, I think that it sort of like depends on where you're at and what you're doing and, you know, and what you sort of have um, decided is the thing that you would like to um, contribute next. Um, and so it's, a, you know, it's hard to say that. It depends on where you are in terms of your awakening. I think in terms of your cleaning, like the cleaning up part, um, yeah. cleaning up is very useful for entrepreneurship, yeah, yeah. incredibly absolutely. useful. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we should, we should add here that, it, you know, I think we've had, we've viewed, uh, let's call them awakening experiences, uh, too simply that they don't have a one, one effect for everyone that the, that the nature, that the effects of an awakening experience, and let's acknowledge there are many, 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 if we were to do this in a sophisticated way, we'd need to map them out. But I think it's increasingly clear that any awakening experience doesn't do something, do the same thing to people. It's much more a function of an interaction between the experience, a person's predispositions, maturity, context, preparation, and most importantly, the attitude and, and, and intention they bring to it. Well, so, so we really need to take a more active interactional perspective and approach to understanding the effects of, effects of opening and, and, and awakening experiences. Yeah, and, and I would say one more thing. It's like, you know, in any case, whether it's entrepreneurship or, um, you know, your relationship or, anything it's like to the extent that you know you were doing things based on filling the hole in your tummy when you stop being driven when one i'm using the royal you when one stops being driven by the hole in the tummy all the things that one used to do to fill the hole in the tummy are going to be at risk and so you know so all those things are going to be at risk so it could be your marriage it could be your job it could be your startup. Now, if the things that you're doing are not to fill the hole in the tummy, um, and because you're doing them from love, universal love, um, then clearing the noise that comes with these, you know, various awakening experiences that comes with the cleaning up experiences and the growing up experiences, the only thing that will happen is that you will get more committed to what you're doing because then you'll be doing it you know, with basically the power, the power of the sun, you know, which is the power of love in its pure form. Um, so yes, anything that's being done to fill, to fill a hole in the belly is at risk, no matter what it is. And that could include your startup. Yeah, so I just want to um, get, go, go through to that. So thank you guys. That's, I think that's a fascinating rabbit hole. Uh, just uh, we've we've not got so much long left. We want to get to get to Lindsay's question. So Lindsay, how can we as a community be mindful of the potential traps of immediacy when developing and promoting technologies that affect cognition? And yeah, the most popular one there is provide psychological safety nets for the outliers. I don't know if you saw that in the in the post. You're still on mute. Yeah, yeah, I was actually really enjoying the conversation that we were having before we opened the, um, the Unpanel comments. And Nicole mentioned the My Feel company that um, integrates the 10 weeks of CBD, um, CBT training, cognitive behavioral mm -hmm. training, with um, some sort of app and wearable with an actual therapist or coach. So I think more and more products like that um, I think that's what those comments are speaking to. I really would like to see more of 
those, like the intersection of actual trained people with the technology too, I think could help. Yeah. And do you have any comments um, to say in terms of your own personal journey with the last thing that we were just speaking about um, with regards to Nicole's point around um, awakening and entrepreneurship? Yeah, I really appreciated listening to Roger talking about karma yoga. Um, there's an integral group of scholars that describe something similar um, and kind of pick up where Maslow left off, where he described the awakening process at the top of the pyramid to be self-transcendent, where a lot of people believe that's where ego dissolution happens. And then you continue to dissolve in that self-transcendence. But um, the integral kind of framework is that Yes, ego dissolution happens, but then you don't completely lose your identity. It actually gets redefined in that process of dissolution. And it's kind of like finding your unique self, your unique gifts, your unique purpose to the larger picture, to the larger evolutionary picture. So then there's different developmental stages of awakening beyond self-transcendence, like um, unique self and then evolutionary unique self. And then there's the, the interaction with, um, so that's the individual, and then there's the evolutionary unique self sympathy, symphony, where we're interacting with everyone else's unique selves um, to move the evolutionary pulse of you know, our life into a beautiful and creative and innovative action. So I just, I saw a lot of similarities with the karma yoga, so I appreciate it, yeah. Yeah, and it seems a common theme that's emerging here from both both what you said, Lindsay and, and Nicole, Nicole uh, and uh, a couple of people pointed to was there's a real, mat there's a potential for maturation of motivation, essentially from the efficiency based to, to sufficiency based and beyond that to, to I, I think I would add above Maslow's hierarchy of, uh, of self-actualization, self-transcendence, I would add selfless service as coming on it comes online at that stage so i think this is an important thing to acknowledge that motivation can can shift dramatically in very valuable ways and and old uh, unskillful motives can drop away and that may mean as uh, as nicole said one's previous uh, professional aspirations yeah <clears throat> well Guys, we're, we're out of time. We, we asked everyone um, the, well, the one question that they was most, most upvoted on the RUM panel. And we also went off in slightly different directions. Um, so I just love to, we got just a minute, just um, like a closing, just a closing word from me, just to say thank you to all the UM panelists. Um, yeah, I think that was a, a somewhat meandering, but really beautiful conversation with a, a common theme like Roger spoke to at the end. And uh, yeah, thank you very, very much to, to Roger, to Lindsay, to Roz, to Nicole, and to Tim. Thank you. And to Which all the audience. in the chat, too. Thank you so much for having us. Indeed, yes. Thank you.